This is for Mitchell R. <laughs> do I have a large coffee? <laughs> I kind of do. And I think I'm going to need it. <laughs> um, uh, yes. <laughs> I'm a little bit discombobulated, but then I am every Sunday morning. My camera is not very well aligned right now. I've just had to move a whole lot of things around. Uh, okay, before we get into anything else, <clears throat> the most important part of this. I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and to Aboriginal elders and peoples from other communities who may be taking part in this live stream today. So, my computer is jumping around all over the place, but there'll be a new one before long, thanks to you. <laughs> it's so cool. Uh, I also had to make a very last minute uh, change. It looks like audio is okay. I had to make a very last minute change to the microphone because that one wasn't working. I swapped in the camera like two minutes before uh, I hit go live. So I think that's working. And we're all good. So, uh, where are we? What are we doing? I don't know. I think I might need to fix this camera alignment a little bit because it had a different camera on this mount earlier and I just, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, the first five minutes of every one of these live streams is totally rubbish and the rest of it isn't any better. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. There are heaps of comments in here already. Um, so, good morning to everybody. Oh, there was a thing in the um, in the start it says, "What do you mean by comments get dropped?" Uh, yeah, I think there is some weird stuff that goes on with the comments in the live stream. <clears throat> if if you start commenting before I go live. Uh, I saw this last week or the week before when Longflare uh, got on, it was like the night before the live stream and put something in and I actually saw his comment and I replied to it and this was like 12 hours before the live stream was going live and then the next morning when I um, came to make the live stream go live, that little chat had disappeared. So there's no grand conspiracy of... Um, of deleting things. I think it's just the way YouTube works with the way the way the chat works on live stream. It's kind of strange that you can get to see the chat before the live stream even exists, but it's kind of cool as well. You can all talk among yourselves while you're waiting for me to get myself so myself organized. Yeah. Uh, oh, Peter says, yeah, I got electricity and internet and mobile phone for the first time since Wednesday. Yes. <laughs> Cool. I'm glad to hear you got it back, Peter. I saw you post, I think it was on Twitter or Facebook or somewhere, uh, that you got it back as well. Um, what's that? Something weird just popped up. Oh, Peter! <laughs> Little dancing party emoji. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, where to begin? Where to begin? All right. Yes. And as Sion pointed out, okay, let's start with this because this is amazingly cool. And uh, let's, hang on, I've just got to launch touch portal on this tablet so I can do OBS scene changes more easily. And let's see if we've got desktop. We have a desktop, hooray. So uh, actually I'm going to open this off screen where you can't see it because I don't want to do make the mistake I did last time of revealing the names of people who want to remain anonymous and I'm really sorry about that I went back afterwards and in YouTube's little management interface I found the bit in the video where I'd revealed those names and I blurred the whole large chunk of the screen out so at least now if you donated anonymously to the GoFundMe, then uh, your name should not be revealed. I did say people's first names in the 
as I was going through it, I, I started calling out people by first name, but I didn't give um, any surnames. So hopefully that is adequately anonymized. Now, okay, here we go. So this is the ridiculous outcome of this, uh, of this little fundraiser. So thank you everybody so much who contributed to this. And also I saw that a few people put in uh, funds used by subscribing on Patreon and um, a couple of new people on GitHub sponsors, which is awesome. So I know that not everybody can... <laughs> I think we've got to get you a dark background. What? A dark background where? Here? Or on the screen? I don't know. Okay, so anyway, this is the outcome. So I set the goal for this to what um, I decided was going to be a uh, an un <clears throat> a large number <laughs> of four thousand dollars, and the idea was that that would be enough to get something like a a well spec sixteen inch MacBook Pro or a a well spec Mac Mini and a large monitor, one of those two things. And um, WWDC happened and there was no hardware announced, <laughs> which was kind of sad. But the rumors are that there's going to be new hardware very soon. So hopefully those machines will come out sometime soon. And uh, then thanks to all of you who contributed, I'm going to uh, have a nice amount of funds to be able to get a replacement for this computer that I'm streaming from right now. And um, so talking to Andy about it afterwards, one of the things that we think is very important is that any additional funds, because this has gone over the goal, it's, an, it's enough to get me a very nice computer, which is fantastic. And uh, it's gone over the goal, but we wanted to make sure that the excess contributions weren't just going into my beer fund or anything like that. They're, um, they are going into things that are useful for the live stream and for video production. And uh, so just wanted to let you know that that is something that I've been thinking about a lot and trying to make sure that any of these... Um, yeah, any of the funds beyond what goes into replacing this computer is going to be used for things that will hopefully benefit everybody, not just me <laughs> sitting on a beach. So <clears throat> uh, I had a couple of suggestions. Um, actually, Dave Jones recently has been using an ATEM Mini, which is one of those streaming, basically a dedicated streaming computer. And um, he said, he told me basically that I should get an ATEM. <laughs> so I've been considering that as a serious possibility. That is a really interesting idea because what it does is take all of the burden of generating the stream and mixing the different video input sources and things off the computer and into a dedicated device. And he's had really good success using an ATEM Mini. And... Um, yeah, so I might, I'm considering getting one of those. The difficulty with that is that the ATEMs don't allow USB input sources, so I can't plug in a USB webcam. Right now, I'm using a Panasonic camera with HDMI capture into my computer. So that would be fine. The overhead camera up there, which is on HDMI capture, would be fine. Normally I have a Logitech Brio USB camera sitting right where you are now. I wouldn't be able to use that anymore. I wouldn't be able to use this camera, which is the, the USB camera that captures the oscilloscope. So there are some limitations. There are a couple of things that I would have to change in order to be able to use an ATEM for streaming. But overall, it's probably a really good option. And there are other things <clears throat> that would be extremely beneficial as well, like lights. Right now, I've got a, it's actually a ceiling light fitting. It's meant to be, you know, it's, it's an office ceiling light fitting leaning against the wall over there pointing at me, and that's my 
lighting and uh, yeah there are other things that could be very useful as well there are many live streaming or video production related things and the other thing of course is funds can be used for buying things that are useful for producing videos and the perfect example of that is the video I'm working on at the moment this mini series for two year and um, a couple of months ago now I went down to Bunnings in previous live streams you've probably seen sorry I'll switch cameras so that you can uh, that's the depth of field on this camera is very shallow so you can't see unlike the webcam which had good depth of field down there sitting behind my jacket you can just see there's a box a long one that's the usb no, not usb that's the two-year uh, power board and uh, i've got a two like a gpo and lots of i've got a whole pile of two-year stuff i went down to bunnings and i bought a whole bunch of different things just so i could pull them apart and make the video so you know, there are things like that that I wouldn't necessarily like I wouldn't go and buy a whole bunch of different miscellaneous two-year devices normally I only did that because I wanted to be able to make the video about it so it can be um, useful for that sort of thing as well so on that subject and that's going to lead into the next thing that follows on from this we have a squirrel train today the two-year thing so my intention had been to upload part two of Two year, the definitive guide to two year Tasmota conversion. I was going to upload it yesterday. That was my schedule so that it would be live for patrons today and then it could go live for the public like tonight or tomorrow. And I've had no power since Wednesday. So all plans went out the window. <laughs> the good thing is though that the video is pretty much done and edited it's and so is the one after it so the um, so part one what is two year is up part two which is two year convert that is pretty well filmed and edited I just need to do uh, a, a, some extra stuff in the intro I want to talk about some things like why it is that two year try to prevent you replacing the firmware because I think that's interesting and uh, a couple of other minor bits so I basically just need to record a couple of minutes of me talking to the camera and then I can upload that one and I've already I've actually got most of the page created as well with screenshots and things it's um, it's not published yet it's uh, it's like kept in draft mode on the Superhouse site but my point is that the next Superhouse video is pretty much ready to go and it may even be up for patrons later today and then the one after that is also pretty much ready to go so that can be up next week and uh, yeah hopefully I will keep a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of momentum going because I have a lot of footage sitting in Final Cut Pro that I need to just record little fill-in bits or bridges or b-roll or whatever and then finishing editing and then I can do quite a few uh, of the um, quite a few more videos so anyway <laughs> to go back a moment thank you so much to everybody that contributed to that GoFundMe that is fantastic and I, yeah I really appreciate it and um, uh, I know that not everybody is in a position to be able to make financial contributions um, and just coming along and chatting to me on a Sunday morning is fantastic as well so thank you to everybody that does that don't feel I do this because I love doing it and uh, you shouldn't feel any obligation to support me or or whatever <laughs> I would still be here doing it it's just that um, with this GoFundMe result it means that I'll have better equipment to be able to keep doing it okay now uh, yeah so I've lost my train of squirrel thought 
Sorry, I'm distracted because there is a buzzing fan. I don't know if you can hear it, but there is a PC power supply sitting down under my bench, which runs all of the LED strips and everything around, all the lighting around my bench. And so it's, um, yeah, it, <laughs> it's distracting me right now. Okay. You can see that I'm really not on the case. Now... <laughs> To get on to the big thing, I was talking about the reason that the video was delayed was that I didn't have, uh, I did not have, so I'm just going to open some stuff on my computer. I'm not even sure if I've synced this. I've got some pictures to show you. And uh, by way of background, for those of you outside of my immediate local area, and other places affected, like in like uh, Peter in Tasmania. Uh, we had a big storm. So, Wednesday night, we had a little bit of a blow and a little bit of wind and rain. Actually, we'd had <coughs> we'd had rain for uh, we'd had so much rain that we had flooding problems by Wednesday night. So what happened was that there was long, long period of, where, of just rain constantly. And uh, so everything was soaking wet. All the trees were loaded down very heavy because of all of the water. And uh, ground softened because water had been soaking into it. And we had places that were flooded. And then Wednesday night, a big blow hit. A storm came in and uh, basically just <clears throat> ripped all the trees out of the ground, flattened lots of stuff. Um, <clears throat> Austin, so you're talking about tree removal at my mum's place. <laughs> I'll get to that. I'm actually just syncing Dropbox right now off my phone because yesterday when I was up there, I took a couple of brief videos and some photos, which I'm going to show you in just a moment. But first, I need coffee. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to find, while that is sinking, I'm going to find a video that was posted by someone else on Thursday. <sighs> this was someone else that posted on Facebook and uh, my wife saw it and then post shared it. Sorry, this is not very exciting, but <clears throat> watching me search for stuff, but I'm just going to find this on the screen while you can't see it and then bring it up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Peter said Melbourne got the winter storm that Tasmania usually gets. Yep. Okay. Uh, come on, this is loading, but just opening Facebook is taking forever. Okay, let's pause this. I'm going to bring this video back, make it full screen. Okay, I'm going to switch to, can I do full screen on this? Yes, but I'm going to mute it. Well, it's kind of full screen. There's weird stuff that comes up on the side on Facebook. All right, uh, desktop, desktop. I don't know how well this is going to go. I'm playing a, um, a video that's in Facebook and pulling it in through screen sharing into OBS and then browsing it. So for reference, this road is the road that is just below my mum's house. So if you went from her driveway down, what we're looking at right now is probably 500 metres from her house. And uh, a large part of the area just looks, um, yeah, it looks like this. 
So it starts off not so bad, but you'll see a little bit further down, it gets worse. Now, the thing is that, so this video was filmed a couple of days ago, and uh, I went up yesterday, um, I can see a tree over there. So I went up yesterday um, with Anne and our son Tom came up as well <clears throat> to get my mum out because she had been trapped in her house for three days with no power and um, no phones. Oh, you can see a power line down there. It gets worse a little bit down here. And when we were up there yesterday, it was actually worse than in this video because trees have continued to fall. The, um, the amount of water and everything and yeah, it basically just everything is loaded up and under stress. <clears throat> And so there were trees that came down in the initial storm and there were quite a few houses destroyed and bad things happened. Well, you can see that like the whole root ball of the tree there has come out. And so the initial damage was bad, but then trees just kept falling. So by yesterday afternoon, this road was actually in worse condition than what you see here with more trees. Uh, Peter says, is that Mount Dandenong Tourist Road? Yes, it is. <clears throat> more power lines down. Uh, I'm just hitting mute on that because I can still hear a little bit of the sound. It's really stuttering through here. Yeah, there are areas where it's really clear. And I think just down here, there is a, a place where there's a flattened house. <clears throat> it gets um, it gets bad again a little bit further down this point and I'll show you some photos in my mum's driveway in a moment <clears throat> yeah just there so where the camera pans into the left you can't really see it very well through all the trees but there is a flattened house through there <clears throat> um, yeah Peter says we have that kind of storm every couple of years so the trees are more often cold so it doesn't cause as much damage yeah that is um, anyway I'm gonna just leave that running so you can see at this point they had managed to clear enough to get at least one lane down the road oh look there's another tree leaning over but as you can see it just goes on and on and on and this was not even the worst damaged area uh, and this is not when it was at its worst as I've just been saying now while that's playing I'm going to find pictures that I took yesterday <clears throat> Oh yeah, and I think the video stops just about there because they come up behind a truck. Yeah, you can see there's a truck through there that had an excavator on it. No, we're not going to look at any of those other things. All right, so just got to. Sorry, I'm just looking through my Dropbox folder at the moment, which should have finished syncing off the phone. And what do we have? <clears throat> yeah, iChips, there's a lot of trees down in Ballarat too. Yeah, there's... Um, uh, which video? Yeah, it's been across a really big area and Gippsland... A big, yeah, it's not just the wind. As I mentioned, it's been so much rain. And in Gippsland, two people have died uh, drowning in their cars <laughs> in the last couple of days, which is nuts. So yeah, there was um, there was some a guy who got swept. His car got swept away by floods, and he climbed. He managed to get out of the car, and then died. And then there was uh, a woman who drove. She was driving into flood water to try to get uh, get along a bit of road or something. Turned out the flood water was two meters deep, and she drowned in her car. And uh, yeah, the flooding. On the Yarra River, I, last night was seven, I think it was seven metres deep. Like it was seven metres above its normal river level. 
Now, where is this video? Okay, this one, maybe this one? Oh, this is just a photo. Okay, so I took this photo standing in my mum's driveway and looking straight down the driveway. So where I'm standing, you can just see here under the trees, that area there, like that area that I've just selected, this is driveway right here. And down there, you can see the road sort of running diagonally. That is the road that she lives off. So her whole driveway down here is just solid jumbled trees and branches. So that's why she hasn't been able to get out. <laughs> she was stuck there for three days until we got her out yesterday. And where's another, where's the video? This one? I think this one. We'll show you a little, <laughs> Chip says, I remember that scene well, yes. But you would remember it without all the trees lying, <laughs> lying across. <clears throat> Taking a while to sink. <clears throat> oh yeah, so this is standing on the road just below, basically where her driveway comes in. And I'm going to hit play. So this is looking up the hill and you can see most of the road has already been cleared. There's a power line down there and I hit play on this. I'm going to pause it a couple of times so it pans around. You can see through all the fog that's, um, that this is state forest through here. It's just wiped out. There are trees flattened all the way through it off into the foggy distance. And right there, that's her driveway. This, um, where I've got the cursor right now, where I'm waving it around just above the controls, that is the entrance to her driveway. And where I took the other photo, looking back down the driveway, you can see there's a tree across the leaning, yeah, off in the distance, you can see a little white diagonal line. That's a tree. And that tree is, if I reopen this one, that tree is this one lying diagonally. So you can see, <laughs> yeah, so I took, I took that photo standing on the far side of that tree up there in the distance, looking back this direction towards the entrance and then hands down around a little bit. Yeah, so you can see the power line here uh, hanging diagonally straight across. And the power, if I go there, yeah. You can't really see it because it's covered, it's in the fog. But down here, in, in that fog, there is an, um, an excavator and a whole crew of people working to clear the road because the road down there was totally blocked by trees that were uh, probably a meter and a half diameter. Some, yeah, some of the trees that had been cut, if I stood next to it where the cut was, <clears throat> the cross section of the tree was bigger than me. Pretty crazy stuff. Anyway. So, uh, the, yeah, so things have been interesting. Uh, there is still a power line actually hanging in my street, across the street. It's, um, it's hanging down, but it's high enough that you can drive underneath it. And uh, someone's got a high-vis vest and thrown it over the power line so that you can see where it is. So as you're driving under, uh, you don't, don't bring up <clears throat> a tall vehicle or something through and run into the power line. But there are some people that are not, well, you can see here, these power lines are down. It's down in this segment, it's down in that segment. It's not just one point where the power line has been broken that has cut power to the area. It is like 
every segment between every single power pole has been brought down. So the first step is to get people out <clears throat> and make them safe and so get access to properties. Um, the SES were there yesterday. Well, they've been there 24 hours a day basically since all of this happened. The SES are awesome. They do such a good job. And uh, yeah, they had said, they'd said that they were going to try to get access to my mum's place by yesterday afternoon and they um they hadn't there were just there was too much to do so they hadn't got to it by yesterday afternoon uh and so we went up to get her out but there were uh, there were police down the the bottom of the hill so at the bottom of this road there were um yeah there were police down there and checking who was going up and why they were going up and they let us get in because we were going up to help evacuate her. And we couldn't get up the main road. We had to go up. <laughs> Chip will remember this one well. We had to come up Old Coach Road. It was, And then at the top of Old Coach Road, that was blocked off as well. We couldn't get through there. So then we had to go down another track. And so it was basically like a, um, a bit of a roundabout four-wheel driving adventure just to get to this point. Like here we've got this nice road, <laughs> even though it's got trees over it. But to get to this area, we had to go uh, kind of bush bashing. Yeah, it's a bit of a disaster. <clears throat> and there are people that are gonna have no power, probably. We've heard there are people in, um, uh, maybe around the Hillsville area that may not have power for a couple of weeks. Because first they have to make it safe and get people out. And then they have to clear. So one of the SES people we were talking to yesterday said that what they were trying to do at the moment was clear the side of the road to allow the power company to get in to make all of the power lines safe. And then once it, that was done and they had managed to clear enough down that side of the road, the power company would be able to come in and put in uh, new power poles where they need to and run new cables. So they're basically going to have to rewire a large chunk of Mount Dandenong. Anyway, uh, Frank says, not as deadly as the bushfires though. Yeah, it's, um, it's a different sort of thing, isn't it? With, with both of these, I suppose with a lot of natural, natural disasters what we have are a couple of different phases of impact the first phase is when the event is happening and it, the damage could be from a bushfire it can be you know burn <laughs> getting burned um, in a storm it's trees falling and power lines and electrocution and uh, yeah things like that and then there is the long-term thing, which happens in both cases. So if you have no power, then you have no heating. And a lot of people have no heating. So no, no access to food or water can be a problem. Like as you can see in this case, access is a problem. And yeah, you just get the long-term knock-on effects. If you've got if you've got a couple of days of no power, people can generally coast. I mean, that's the wrong word. I was going to say they can coast through it, but for a couple of days, you can usually get by with the food that you've got in the house. Your milk is eventually going to go off because you've got no refrigeration, but a couple of days you can survive it, you're not going to die. And then it becomes more and more difficult after that. It, in the short term, it's like camping. In the longer term, you've got to start making, you've got to start doing things to improve the situation. Uh, so here we had, now luckily at my house, like directly at my house, 
we almost entirely avoided any physical damage. We got some branches down in the backyard, but that's the only, oh, and there's debris everywhere. In fact, this shows you how strong the wind was. I had a table tennis table on the back veranda, which is totally protected from the weather. It's under a veranda and so the house is in a U shape around it. And that table tennis table blew over during the storm. Got treated like a sail and picked up by the wind. But apart from, you know, the fact that we've got bits of branches and debris everywhere, like all over our yard and street and that sort of thing, we've avoided actual physical damage here at my house. But we've got the, um, the secondary effects of no power. So we had, have had no refrigeration, no heating, no um, hot water. And uh, yeah, we could boil water on the stove, um, but we didn't have hot water for showers and things until I rigged up a thing, which is probably worth talking about. That's kind of cool. But there are people that had it so much worse than me, uh, as you can see from the picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, long life milk. That's a good idea, having that sort of thing. Uh, yes. <clears throat> and he says, after the third day without power, superhouse automation battery powered devices started cannibalizing each other. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was a um, an interesting opportunity to... Um, to try some creative solutions to problems. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where you lose power and your immediate reaction is to, uh, basically just to grab torches or, you know, do whatever very short term workarounds you have. And then after a day, I start modifying things to make them work again because it's annoying me. And then after two days, I've modified more. <laughs> and by the third day, I'm getting in and re seriously rewiring stuff so that I can get power. Uh, <laughs> I can get power to things that would not would not normally operate off anything except mains. So, um, okay, a good example. The we went without, we didn't have any hot water, like no, we've got gas hot water, but it's one of those Rinnai Infinity continuous systems, which means that it needs electricity to run the controller and the blower for the, the um, heat exchanger for the burner. So it uses gas for its bulk energy, which it uses for actually heating the water, but it still needs mains in order to run. Without mains, the gas is irrelevant. You just can't generate hot water. So I, um, I, <laughs> I went hunting into my, uh, my big pile of never st throw stuff out. And I found, uh, an old inverter that is, I think about, uh, how old would it be? It'd be 30 years old. Yeah, it would be, it'd have to be 30 years old. It's an old 150 watt inverter. It takes 12 volts input and gives you 240 volts, 150 watts. So a very small amount of power, not much you can pull out of it, but it gives you 240 volts. And I hooked that up to a 12 volt uh, lead acid battery, you know, like one of those little motorcycle battery sort of things, I think, except I think they're normally six volt. Anyway, little, okay, security system battery or, um, uh, UPS battery, same thing, like a 6 amp hour, 12 volt lead acid battery. I hooked that up to the inverter and ran power into the controller for the gas hot water. And then we had hot water again, which was awesome. And, uh, <laughs> oh, Peter says, did the lawnmower keep going? No, it didn't. The mower has batteries. It needs mains to charge and the boundary loop is powered by the base station. And when power fails, the mower detects that there's no boundary loop, so it won't run. So the mower can actually be running, like you can have it out there running on its battery doing its thing. And if you turn off power to the base station, 
the mold just stops. It'll, it sits there and freezes because it can't detect the boundary. It knows it's gone. And if it keeps moving, it could run over the boundary and go into places it shouldn't. So it stops. <laughs> yeah, it's got a bunch of little treadmill generators for the squirrels. Um, yeah, so anyway, as I was saying, I ended up <laughs> rewiring stuff. Um, so a friend of mine, Steve, turns out he has a pretty decent sized generator. And uh, I went over and got that on Friday. When was it? Yeah, Friday afternoon. I went and borrowed his generator. And then we had the classic situation of extension cords snaking all through the house. It was a three um, kilowatt generator, which is pretty decent size. And um, certainly not enough to run heating type stuff. So, you know, hair dryers, electric kettles, microwave, all of those sorts of things. They all take, you know, uh, this typically 2,400 watts for a hair dryer or for a kettle. They all run on like 10 amps at 240 volts. So all of that sort of stuff is out. But you can really classify appliances into two, <laughs> two types, high power and low power. And a lot of stuff is low power, which means that you can... We could do things like recharge our phones and laptops. And um, the other thing was my daughter's fish tank. She has tropical fish and it's been rather cold here. So it was 10 degrees Celsius in the house. And uh, the temperature on her fish tanks were dropping. And um, so the first thing I tried to do was I got some peltier. In fact, I think, yeah, I have one right here. Uh, Peltier device so I hooked up I hooked this up with Ryobi battery packs and um, tried to get some heat into the fish tank but there wasn't enough energy I could only get about 8 to 10 watts out of that which wasn't enough it basically reduced the rate at which the tank was getting cold but it didn't stop it the temperature continued to fall and oh yeah so here's another kind of cool little hack. Uh, where are we? Overhead. So one thing that I've, this is something I've been meaning to do a video about at some point. Ryobi battery packs. I, because I like standardization. I like it when everything is the same and stuff is interchangeable. Things like interchangeable battery packs make me happy. And uh, so what I've tried to do is stick with Ryobi cordless tools because then I can use the same battery pack and everything. So I've got just down here. Even though it is not the best handheld cordless vacuum cleaner, I got a Ryobi handheld cordless vacuum cleaner for the office, mostly because it would then be compatible with the battery packs. And compatibility and interchangeability has value to me. It's actually worth sacrificing a little bit of performance on one on a particular tool in order to uh, to get that interchangeability. So the result is that I have a few of these batteries, and when this happened, these all my batteries were charged, which was awesome. Uh, I don't know what no, this one's flat now. <laughs> so I had a whole bunch of Ryobi batteries that were charged. This is a 3D printed thing that I actually made a while ago and it's got, you can see down in there, it's got contacts. There are little bent bits of uh, spring steel that make contact with the Ryobi battery. And inside there, jammed in that section, there is a 5 volt regulator module which is connected to this USB socket. And there's one of those little um, Ryden power supply modules, which I've just unplugged, but that connects into it as well. So the idea is with this little combination, I'm not going to plug it right back in. Oh, yes, I will. Stop it. All right. So that is like a DIY Ryobi compatible tool. And you can grab that Oop. <laughs> because I've just, oh, I just rotated this. That's what it is. I've just stuffed it up. Anyway, the idea is, what did I do? I think, ah, oh, 
Yes, while I was messing around with that, I just broke it. <laughs> so that clips on there, and then you can charge phones and things off that. And you can turn this on and dial up. Is it going to? No, the battery's flat. So you can dial up whatever voltage you like on this and use that for powering things as well. Luckily, I already had that. I'd made it a while ago, so that was really, really useful. And I ended up using Ryobi batteries in different ways to power. <laughs> Scott says, how did I survive without a hairdryer? It was a struggle. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, anyway. Anyway, <laughs> I had it easy. I basically could, okay, we had no power. We still actually have no proper phone coverage. If I um, showed you my phone, there's, I have zero bars of coverage. The only way I can get, I can send SMSs maybe half the time they go through. Like if I send a message, it'll sit there saying sending for sometimes 10 minutes or 20 minutes and it'll get just enough of a, it'll catch enough of a signal that it will be able to get the SMS out and I can receive SMSs sometimes as well. Uh, sometimes I will get service like one bar for a little while and then it just goes away again. So I still have no phone coverage. So no phone coverage, no electricity, no internet. Oh, and the NBN was down as well. I actually tested this. When we got the generator, I powered up the, uh, the NTU and the router, and um, I couldn't get line sync on the NBN connection. So no internet. And it wasn't just us not having power. There was nothing at the other end. And I assume that's because whatever the nodes were, like the local nodes, I don't have fiber here. It's like that hybrid fiber coax HFC thing. So there, somewhere in my neighborhood, there is a box that the cable goes to, and that does the conversion from fiber to the coax. And presumably that had no power either. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, oh, so Mike said, no mobile Wi-Fi calling via internet. No, I had no internet. No power, no internet, nothing. And Peter Kirchhoff says, imagine an actual apocalypse. We're screwed. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's one of the interesting things I've been thinking about. It shows how dependent we are on infrastructure. And the only reason that we can survive living in cities is the systems that allow us to do it. If, if we run out of access to food, water, power, etc., and uh, we're all packed into this little area, then we're in trouble. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've, over the years, I've tried to avoid over the recent years, anyway, I've tried to avoid getting sucked into gaming too much. And uh, a long, long time ago, I used to spend too much time playing computer games. And uh, then uh, a few years ago for my birthday, it's going to sound like there's nothing to do with what I'm... <laughs> there is a point to this with what I'm talking about. A few years ago, um, I got a PS4 for my birthday. And with the PS4, I've got a second-hand game, which was The Last of Us. And uh, so The Last of Us and then The Last of Us Part 2 are probably the games that I have been most obsessed with over the last few years. I love both of them, uh, both Part 1 and Part 2. And yes, I know Part 2 caused a lot of controversy, but the, they're, they're, they're zombie survival games. It's all about living after the apocalypse, after the zombie apocalypse, and scavenging for resources and um, finding uh, <laughs> food and fuel and alcohol and uh, in order to, you know, 
disinfect and getting things to craft stuff and finding ammunition and those sorts of things. And uh, it's kind of, I know those sorts of, those sorts of games, uh, they deviate from reality a very, very long way. When you look at any of those sorts of survival games, the way it looks like society goes or the way it looks like the world goes in the game it's, I don't think it's the way the world would really go in an actual apocalypse where it's everyone for themselves and government starts to break down and that sort of thing. I think it would, I have a feeling it would be both better and worse than is represented in those games. Uh, yeah, I think the, um, I, a huge number of people would die relatively quickly. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Doshi says it's not a squirrel if it's just a tangential point. Now, uh, my friend Chris, so I'm healthy and fit. Uh, I'm not dependent on any medication or anything other than, you know, food and water, basically. But people, uh, not everybody is in that situation. So this sort of thing is rather more dire for my friend Chris. And um, I, I've talk, I talked about him on the live stream fairly regularly. And uh, some of you might have seen that a talk that I did with him at LinuxConf on the Gold Coast a couple of years ago. It was LCA before last, so 18 months ago we did a talk about... Um, building custom input devices for people with disabilities and uh, so Chris is Chris has Duchenne muscular dystrophy he has one functional lung and is on permanent life support so he needs a ventilator to get enough um, oxygen into his bloodstream to keep him alive and uh, so it, he has a couple of ventilators, which are battery powered. I th the batteries last, I think around, the, they last easily a day. Um, I have a feeling that they might be 14 to 16 hours, perhaps, something like that. So in a situation like a, um, a blackout happens, a regular blackout, and it goes for a little while or an hour or two, it's no sweat. But once it starts stretching out to multiple days, that becomes life-threatening for many people. And um, as you can imagine, uh, this is not the first time this sort of thing has, uh, has been an issue for them. And so uh, Chris's stepfather, Peter, has put a lot of work into being very prepared for this sort of situation. Uh, they have two generators, so they've got a, um, they used to have a 3 kVA um, generator, and then they bought a 9 kVA generator, and the, um, they still, they keep the 3 kVA one as a backup, but basically it means they can do things like run, they can recharge ventilator batteries and um, run all of the, the life support sort of stuff that Chris needs, and um, they got their power back yesterday morning, um, but they were without power for a few days and no internet um, in that time as well. So no communications and no power. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> yeah, the, um, the generator that they run so that they basically just been running their <laughs> generator pretty much continuously for several days it runs through 20 liters of fuel a day uh, it, because Chris can run oh and the other issue is for Chris in particular because he has Duchenne muscular dystrophy one of the effects of that is that Basically, well, the term muscular dystrophy, it's your, your muscles are no longer working for 
there are different types of muscular dystrophy, but the upshot is new muscles don't work anymore. And one of the side effects of that is the inability to shiver and the inability to generate heat from your body doesn't generate heat anymore like the way um, it should so chris is constantly cold um, well a better way to put it is he can't regulate his body temperature uh, and so it's not just being cold it's also being hot and being that being hard to deal with so um so it's not just a matter of keeping power up to the ventilator it is also uh, being able to heat him up uh, so luckily they um they have gas they had a, like a gas fireplace which they could run so um, they connected the generator to the the necessary systems and uh, they've been using the gas heating to keep Chris warm for the last few days. Um, yeah, <clears throat> not a fun situation. Good news is Chris is fine. He's probably bored out of his mind, <laughs> unable to play Eve online, <laughs> unable to uh, to chat on, you know cut off from his normal communication with people so unable to uh, to, to communicate with anyone the only way i've had any contact is getting sms's through occasionally and of course all of this has happened all of this happened i should point out during a covid lockdown when we were not meant to leave the house <laughs> yeah <clears throat> all right so Alex said, my house almost flooded, southeast Victoria. Oh, when I said your name then, it woke up my voice assistant. So I just had to hit the mute button on that. Yeah, southeast Victoria. So down around Gippsland Way, that's been hit really badly by flooding. That's, yeah, the news is just full of it. Um, whew, all right, so... So far, this live stream has just been like a real life disaster movie. There are some other things to talk about. Now, uh, squirrels. So, the, the mention of squirrels. Peter, did someone mention alcohol? Um, no, but I'm hoping someone mentioned caffeine. Hang on a second. Time for an update on our little um, on our little project. Let's see. The weird thing is that because I've been I've basically been sitting in the cold in the dark in my house for days, I've had no idea what's going on in the world. But let's um, let's catch up on things. So since we got power back last night, I've gone online and looked at a couple of things. Just trying, <laughs> I've looked at Facebook messages and you probably, you might've seen me do Twitter updates and things occasionally. I, um, if I walk to the hill up behind my house, we're sitting at the, um, the base of a, a hill and uh, it's not very high. It's just like a, but it's enough that if I walk to the top of that hill, I can hit the mobile phone towers over towards Ringwood and then I can get coverage on my phone. So um, <laughs> I've been intermittently posting uh, stuff on Twitter over the last few days. While we were blacked out, I've been, uh, maybe a couple of times a day, I've been able to get a, enough of a connection that I could look on Twitter and reply to a couple of Facebook messages and things. So what are we looking at here? Sign in. Okay. What was I talking about? I was talking about uh, the state of the um, the little live stream project that we have been doing for way, way, way too long, 
and uh, I ordered the PCBs early in the week before, uh, where are we here? Yeah, my, um, my JLC PCB order history, it goes back a ways. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, what am I looking for? Okay, a couple of things. Let's start with this one. Oh, okay, production progress. Production progress, it's all done. Awaiting carrier pickup. How cool is that? Have I just disclosed the tracking number? No, I didn't. Good. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, okay, so our PCBs are done. Oh, and also, one thing I've got to say, mo I keep forgetting, okay, we're looking at the, um, the build status here in JLC PCB, and they show previews of things like your PCB. So you click on this and you can zoom in and you can see their render of their interpretation of the, um, the PCB design. And uh, when, when there are stencils that are ordered, they show a stencil as well. I keep being thrown off by the fact that the stencil preview does not look, it's not generated automatically. It's a generic stencil and it's got stuff on little weird diagonals. It's a very, whatever they used as their thumbnail for this stencil, I wonder if we can, um, where is it, open image? I wonder if it is just tiny. Yeah, it is just tiny. I can zoom in a little bit. Yeah, you can see. Look at this, they've got parts on these weird diagonals. It's like it's a triangular PCB or like someone made a stencil with things just randomly plonked down and rotated. Oh look, there's a, I think that's a voltage regulator. You can see the thermal tab just there. And then there are three pins there, but it's at a weird angle. It's like, it's not even 45 degrees. It's like 30 degrees or something. Anyway, they, they have this little thumbnail for the stencil. And just about every time I order a stencil here, I have that little, uh, m like a little heart attack moment where they show me the preview of the board and I think, oh yeah, that looks good. And then the preview of the stencil one, I think, oh, there's something wrong. Oh no, there's nothing wrong. <laughs> it's just a generic thumbnail. So this is the, let's go to production details on that. I, um, no, can we see more details? Uh, let's see. Oh, good. We can see the whole thing. Processing, processing. So this is the multimeter thing after the live stream. So last week we kind of finished this except for silk screen. It, um, we did the routing on it and uh, I just needed to clean up the indication of which pins were used and all those sorts of things. And um, so I'm really sorry, but I can't remember who. Someone questioned on Twitter why I had used GPIO 0 for the data connection when on an ESP8266, GPIO 0 puts the, um, the thing into bootloader mode. So it's a pin that you really need to avoid if you possibly can. And um, so the answer is that D0 on a WeMOS D1 Mini is not actually GPIO0, it's G I think it's GPIO16 or 20, no, not 21, that's used for I2C. I think it might be GPIO16, perhaps. I can't remember. But it was a very valid point because uh, on this silk screen, what I should have done is marked... So there are two different numbering conventions here for the pins. One is the Arduino style convention and the other is the microcontroller's direct GPIO identifier or IO identifier. So normally on a thing like on most boards, like if it's a board with a, an ESP module on it, like a Vroom32 or something or a board that I've designed that has an ESP on it directly, then what I do is I label everything based on the raw pin number. And um, in this case, I ended up using D0 and D4 
kind of because I wasn't thinking very hard about it. And these are the labels that are used on the Wemos D1 Mini because it's Arduino style pin numbering. And what I should have done was, what I probably should have done is put D0 slash GPIO 16 or, you know, I'm probably wrong on that number, but I should have included both on that label. Anyway, the point is, this is it. <laughs> um, let's, um, will I, yeah, okay. It might be useful having Fusion 360 open, so I'm just gonna start that opening in the background. Yeah, oh, the squirrel icon, yes. <laughs> so Aaron says, hey, the squirrel icon looks great. Uh, yeah, this was from the, uh, the squirrel that was posted last, during the live stream last week, there was an SVG of a squirrel. And in the end, I recreated it from scratch using, using splines in Eagle. And this is something that I'm kind of a little bit, hang on, let's have a look, solder mask. Let's turn off outline layer. I don't know, that's it. Yeah, there is this weird thing in Eagle where you can make a shape using a spline, but only if it's on the, um, the dimension layer. So the idea is that you can use a spline to make a strange shaped PCB, but you can't use a spline and select the silkscreen layer, which is really weird. Like, well, not weird. It's annoying. Because most of the time when I want a spline, it's because I want to do some kind of a shape on the silk screen. It's not necessarily because I want to do, um, you know, a nicely eased curve on the outline of the PCB. PCBs are either squared off edges or just a, a radius and that's it. I don't normally care about a spline on a PCB outline. And <clears throat> um, so... I was frustrated by this. I was, I really wanted to do this squirrel and, um, oh, great new version of Fusion 360. It's what happens when your computer hasn't been running for most of the week or your software gets updated. Uh, so I really wanted to do this. The thing is that if you take an SVG or a PNG or a BMP or whatever, and bring it into Eagle, there are several different methods by which it can recreate the shape for the silk screen. The easiest way to do it is to run a script that basically rasterizes the image and it makes a whole lot of tiny lines and you end up with an enormous uh, board file because it can have thousands of tiny line segments to make up a little bit of a curve and they're all horizontal lines yes they're all horizontal lines but basically you can think of it as being like a raster scan on a tv so it makes all of these lines that are very very um, short vertically and then they just run horizontally to whatever they want so when you run the script it generates um, it generates thousands of tiny lines that make up the shape and that is really inefficient and it sucks. It makes the um, it makes the board very slow to work with in Eagle. It just bogs down. And um, <clears throat> so what happened was I ended up recreating the squirrel um, from scratch. So what I did was I took the SVG, like I had the, the image open, the one that was posted in the live stream. I just had that open on the screen and then beside it I had Eagle open and I just sketched it and uh, and did it using splines. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but that's right. So the splines problem. I uh, What I started to do was look at the possibility of creating um, Maybe we should bring up Eagle. And uh, so what I decided to do was look at the possibility of creating the shape on the dimension layer 
and then going into the raw board file, which is XML, and editing it to change the layer designators to put the to move the shape onto the top silkscreen layer, because Eagle will not let you create splines in a silkscreen layer, only in a dimension layer. And while I was messing around with it, I somehow and I can't I haven't been able to reproduce it. This is really weird. I somehow tricked Eagle into creating a spline on the silkscreen layer and then I couldn't do it again. So what I ended up doing was copying and pasting that same spline and then manipulating it to make all the different shapes and curves within the squirrel. And it worked. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite weird. So the thing is, and then when I did the, um, I did the, the job to generate the production files, it all came out. So what you're looking at right now is the JLC PCB render of the Gerbers that I sent it, that I sent them. And it looks, as far as I can tell, I haven't actually seen the PCBs yet, but as far as I can tell from the previews that have been generated, the production files were generated correctly with the, um, the shape of the squirrel on the silkscreen layer. It's not on the, um, the dimension layer, even though it's done using splines. So, <clears throat> Andy discussing meta squirrels leads to micro black hole formation. <laughs> and Chip, yes, it is a squirrel squirrel. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> anyway. I do need to switch over to Fusion for my PCB layouts and maybe all of these problems would go away. Okay, so Eagle is opening. It's complaining about being offline. Oh no, now it's come online. Projects. Projects. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah. Um, ah, Pancake Legend says, Keycat has these weirdnesses too. Fortunately, all their files are highly editable, so you can produce what you want in another layer, then change the layer in a text editor. Yeah, that's the... That was what I was starting to do in Eagle, because it's all XML. You can just edit all the Eagle files. Um, what was I looking for? UT61E Wi-Fi. All right. This would be... So this is how I generated these files. Now, um, let's go to, all right, I'm gonna demonstrate the problem. The problem with splines. So let's go to T place, okay? So I am in the top place layer and here is the spline tool look up the top here, you can see it says layer 21 T place, select spline tool, boom, look at that, it's changed to layer 20 dimension. And if because I've got the spline tool selected, if I go here, I can't select anything else, it just will not let you choose any other layer. So if I now create a spline here, like that, boop. So we now have a nice little spline that is in the dimension layer. And then if I go into the info, look at this, I can't change it. It is locked to that layer. So, um, yeah, and I don't, I, I have not been able to figure out yet how I stumble, stumbled on it, but I did some weird sequence that allowed me to create a spline on the, um, like look at this, this is a spline and it is on the T-place layer and uh, that it was some combination of going into single layer mode at the right, in the right sequence. So let's just go back to, all right, so I'm on dimension layer. Let's go back to T-place layer. I'm going to go into single layer mode. 
So I am now forced to be on that layer. If I select the spline tool, boom, I'm back on dimension layer. Even though I was in single place layer here. Um, what did I do? How about select that? No, then I can't change it because I've got the tool selected. Anyway, and did you check the enable splines on all layers checkbox? What? What do you mean the enable splines on all layers checkbox? Is that a joke? Daniel, I really hope you are not joking because if there is such a checkbox, yes, damn. <laughs> Um, oh, Michael says, can you copy the spline from one layer and paste it to another? Oh, um, doot, doot, doot. let's see. And the other thing that's weird about, okay, so I'm going to copy that. Eagle behaves differently, copying and pasting groups versus individual items. So at the moment we're on the, I've copied, we're on the dimension layer. If I now select T place, put it down. Ooh, I wonder if that worked. No, it's still on the dimension layer, even though we've got T-Place layer selected. So one thing that Eagle is weird about, okay, I'm going to delete this and we are going to go to, yeah, maybe this is part of the answer. We're on the dimension layer. I'm going to do a group. It's only a single object. There's only one spline, but still I'm going to do a group and then copy group and then escape so I no longer have anything selected change layer to T place edit and paste and let's see what happens okay no nope, not that I want to now I want to deselect go to info and it's still on dimension Hmm. Yeah. Copy spline to clipboard, lay, uh, change layer and command V. Yeah, basically that's what I just did. So, um, although I did it using paste from the menu instead of command V, but still, let's, I would not be surprised if there is enough weirdness that command V behaves differently to selecting paste out of the menu, but no, it doesn't. So you can see my problem. It is persistently staying in the, um, in the dimension layer, even though I've been trying to copy to the T place layer, but here's a spline that's in the T place layer. So yeah, I was just fiddling around and somehow I created a spline in fact, I created a couple of splines on the T-Place layer and then it just wouldn't, I couldn't do it again. I could not recreate whatever it was that I did that made it work. So I'm curious now. Let's, um, I'm going to say, okay, so we've got, that is now on T dimension. Oh yeah, on 20 dimension. I'm going to save that. Let us close this and I need a terminal come on my term <laughs> it's always dangerous doing this because what happens is that when you open the um, open a program it can switch windows and bring up something that could already be in a terminal all right so let's see the Oh, I'm still waiting for it to come to its prompt. Um, yeah, there's some stuff I think in my pr dot profile. See how it's saying Python 3 at the top of the screen? I think there is some stuff that runs in the profile that takes ages to execute. So when I open a new terminal, it takes a while. Um, no, what am I doing? Superhouse, Dropbox, Dropbox, Superhouse, Projects. UT61E hardware. This will do. And a whole lot of untracked files. So let's have a look at UT61E board. Board. All right. 
So, what has changed? We've got grid, we've got, uh, I don't care about that. Oh, looks like I've got some uncommitted stuff, which is annoying. Because what I was hoping was that the only thing in the diff would be that spline. Where is it? Layer number. Um, BMP. Uh, layer 20, wasn't it? Oh, come on. I've had enough of this beach ball. Not for much longer, though. As soon as Apple do their thing. Ah, oh, Fusion is still opening <laughs> from like 10 minutes ago. Um, okay, what I'm looking for is layer 20 in the board file. Layer 20, number equals 20. I can't even see it there. I'm sure I put... Uh, okay. Let's, um, this is going to bring up heaps of stuff. That's not going to be any use. Let's do grip layer grip 20. And I know I'm chaining grips and that's kind of silly. Uh, no, layer why aren't I seeing wire? Oh, maybe it's the, oh, it's the wire. There it is. Okay. X1. So let's do 93.98. Mm -mm. And three point. Nine point one eight was it one eight? Was it nine eight? Layer number thing is that I don't, um, someone's probably going to be telling me the um, how to, uh, you're just seeing me <laughs> bumbling around now. Um, what am I looking for? I don't even know what I'm looking for. Layer, layer. <laughs> hmm. I could, I could just stop talking to you now and just be sitting here fiddling around silently for a while. What I'm looking for is layer equals 20 there we go but i want the i don't want to actually mess up the yeah it's not these ones it'll be this here we go yes the spline on layer 20 so let's change this one to layer 21 oh a whole lot of messing around <clears throat> all right Back to Eagle. Come on. Hooray. Let's... I could have just command tab to it. <clears throat> All right. Moment of truth. Let's see. Where is this? <laughs> it still says it's on the dimension layer. Oh. I hope I didn't kill the wrong thing. I hope I didn't edit the wrong thing. So, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I may have just damaged this project by editing the wrong spline. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, Aaron. Uh, Aaron says, M1X is rumoured for September now. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Chip says, coffee layer. Yes. Uh, Scott said, reload it. Yeah, but I actually, I didn't even have it open at the time. I, um, I had closed the project while I was editing it directly. Uh, Aaron says, try single board, uh, let's say single layer mode in Command-V. Yeah, I did that earlier, actually. That's, that's what I was trying to do earlier. And that didn't work. 
it still pasted it into the dimension layer even when I was in top paste and not top paste, top silk and in single layer mode and paste it still it still put it into the wrong place so anyway I'm kind of just muddling around here and <laughs> oh. <clears throat> I know I spent the first <clears throat> hour plus just talking about miscellaneous life stuff <clears throat> but I kind of feel a need to be productive in some way right now so where I was going with this before I went off chasing this squirrel squirrel is that the um, the board is done <laughs> that's a very short version of it <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, JLC PCB is on holiday for the next two days. Okay, I've got two days to get some more boards done. So this is now completed production and waiting carrier pickup. So that can vary a lot. Sometimes DHL will get it the same day that the board is finished and sometimes it can sit there for days and days before it gets picked up. Uh, which seems to be very much dependent on how um, how messed up the logistics system of the world is at the time. Generally, it's pretty quick. Like once once the PCB factory finishes making the boards and they have them ready for pickup, usually DHL will get them, you know, same day or within 24 hours. Let's see what's on the bottom. <clears throat> uh, but sometimes it can take a while. All right. Now, Fusion. Is Fusion finished opening? Yes, it has. I better get out of that one. That's a client project. <laughs> this is the danger of live streaming. <clears throat> I think it might actually still be in the process of opening why I can't do anything much here yet. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, uh, come on. Show me the projects. All right. We're getting closer. We are narrowing in. <clears throat> Oh, and the bad news, while well, I'm waiting for Fusion to scroll its list of projects, the bad news is over there, <clears throat> on the previous live stream, I had my old iMac in pieces, and you could see it there. I received the, um, the replacement power supply, and I swapped it in, and um, it, oh, maybe this is why it's so slow. And uh, it didn't fix the problem. So my old iMac is still dead, even with the new power supply. Which really, really sucks. Which means that my old power supply was probably okay. Ooh. We're getting closer. We're going to be able to open this project soon. Here we go. <clears throat> <clears throat> I think this must be a new record <clears throat> for how long it's taken Fusion to open. It's got to be about, it'll be heading on 20 minutes now <clears throat> since I started opening Fusion and we're still not into a project. Aha, here we go. Update components. You can see that the board is a bit out of date there. It doesn't have the silk terrain. Oh, in fact, the, um, the parts are in the wrong position. This version of the project is from when we were just talking about all the different orientations and how the boards should fit together. Now we're closer to it. Still updating. What is it doing? 
Ah, okay, cool. It's updated. The position is wrong for the D1 Mini. That's kind of annoying. I thought I'd change that. Anyway, there's the D1 Mini uh, with our board. And you can see the cute little squirrel there. So we've got the, um, the WS2812 up the top here so that we can show status, show as it's connecting to Wi-Fi and then to MQTT. Here's the MOSFET, which does the, um, which acts as an inverter for the data coming from the multimeter and then pumps it into the D1 Mini, which will not be in that position. In fact, let's fix that. The actual position, if I, if I double space these plastic layers here, I mean, it could be there. That's approximately where it would be if it had the um, if it had the headers mounted underneath it. But my general plan is that I'm going to take that, move it, move. Come on, select the tool. There we go. Rotate the view around. Come on, give me the... Oh, so laggy. Give me a point. Okay. Move. So... What I'm probably going to do is just solder the D1 Mini directly onto the header pins. So... The two PCBs, once these are soldered together, and the pins, the headers are in, they're never coming apart again. It's going to be sandwiched for life. <clears throat> uh, yeah, oh, someone, I just glanced over at the chat and saw LSC. I haven't actually read the comments related to it, but I just saw the LSC, light switch controller, mentioned in the chat. And uh, that is what I'm going to get to in just a moment. Oh, look, <laughs> that has come off the thing. What I should have done was, yeah, I messed up the selection of this. I'm not going to save this change. I should have selected this whole object and moved it instead of an anchor point on the, um, the board. But anyway, that's basically where it's going to be. If you ignore the USB socket floating out there in space and imagine that being attached to the D1 Mini, this is what we will have. So my plan is to get some clear heat shrink and just um, shrink it up like a power blocker. <laughs> Wave to Brian. And um, yeah, then we're kind of done because I got lazy and I can't be bothered designing a 3D printed case to put around it. But uh, there was an offer last week, someone suggested that they could design a case to go around it, which would be really cool. Wireless USB. <laughs> yes, that's right. <clears throat> uh, okay, so that's right, LSC. <laughs> Had to pause for a moment. Now let's get back to here. Back to here. And in fact, back to, in fact, yeah, it's not all that interesting looking at it in here. The point of looking at it here is that they are all done. Look at this. We've got the 24 port version of the light switch controller, the RJ45 breakout, the 16 port version, and down here, the eight port version and stencils for all of them. You can't really see very much. But the important thing is that they are all produced, they are sitting there at JLC waiting pickup, and they are done. Um, they, uh, yeah, 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 we'll open them in, no, let's just open them in, no, Eagle, okay. <laughs> I'm trying to decide the best way to look at this. So, LSC, LSC hardware, and let's look at the, yes, the 24 port version. Uh, and what do we do? Put T place up 
and run that. Yeah, this is better for looking at the logical layout anyway. So I'm just, just going to turn off T place and B place layers because what I ended up doing was changing everything. This whole board has been rerouted from scratch. And the, um, so the, the RJ45 connectors are in the same place. And um, that's it, actually. Oh, hang on, no, the, um, the MCP23017s, they are in the same location, like that grid coordinate has not changed. Every single other thing on this has changed. The, um, the board is a bit bigger now. You can see that uh, previously the PCB used to wrap around here and ended behind these back mounting holes. <laughs> I, I said something about this on Twitter early in the week. It's one of those funny things where I, <clears throat> I was working on this board and I wanted to add some things to it. And I busted myself trying to make them fit and I was jammed in tight. So, so the backstory to this is uh, certain people, <laughs> wave to camera, don't like the solder jumpers <clears throat> that I had for the I squared C pull ups. <clears throat> <clears throat> so where all of this started is I had two solder jumpers right here for I squared C pull ups. And um, uh, Dodgy Brothers said, uh, these are not his words, but his sentiment was, um, solder jumpers suck, <laughs> pinheaders rule. So <laughs> I ended up switching the, um, the solder jumpers and replacing them with pinheaders so that if you want to enable or disable I squared C pull ups, you can just use uh, the little jumpers onto them. And that was okay. I could make that kind of fitted. Like if you look at this, this previously the top edge of the PCB was just behind this mounting hole and it was pretty much where the cursor goes across horizontally. And um, so what I did was these pin headers were lower down and they were within the boundary of the PCB. And then I started thinking, well, okay, the thought process didn't actually start with the 24 port version because with the 24 port version, the I squared C addresses, you can't really, there's no point changing them. We're using six of the eight available addresses. You might as well just start at the base address and work up in increments of one. So previously on the 24 port version of the board, I had the I squared C addresses hard set on the address pins. You couldn't change them. There was nothing you could do about it. But on the eight port version, you do want to be able to change the addresses because you might want to daisy chain them. You might want to just move it to a different address so you can use uh, like IO chips for other purposes. So you definitely want the address pins to be configurable. And <clears throat> so that's in this one. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Uh, so that's in this one. And so I, um, <clears throat> I wanted to make selectable addresses. And because I was already <clears throat> replacing the pull-up headers with, um, with pin headers instead of solder jumpers for dodgy, I thought maybe what I should do is make the, um, the I squared C addresses also pin headers and not solder jumpers. So my temptation was to just put solder jumpers on here, but that's kind of annoying. I thought if I'm going to go the whole hog, I might as well do it. I'll just put uh, pin headers on here and then you can select whatever addresses you like for these two uh, MCB 23017s. So um, I did, and but look at this. The, um, the top edge of the board was right there where my cursor line was. And look what it intersects. It comes across here. And I wanted to be able to run a track around the top of here as well to run VCC through here. And I just, I couldn't make it fit neatly. 
And the other thing is that, and this is kind of a silly side thing, but if I turn back on the, um, the silk screen layer, there was no room for labels for anything. Like if I turn on T-Place, I couldn't even put the name of the device on here. I couldn't, I didn't have room to note addresses or anything. And I had been, I was sitting there in Eagle, messing things around. I was thinking about moving the chip down to make room and then I could fit these jumpers in here. And it was like one of those head slapping moments where I thought, just make the PCB bigger. <laughs> and it, um, sometimes when you're designing PCBs, you are physically constrained by the enclosure or, you know, whatever shape you're wanting to fit it into. Sometimes you're not. And in this case, it's not. This whole thing is sitting inside a rack mount enclosure. Who cares if it's got an extra eight or five millimeters or whatever it is sticking on the back. <laughs> the, the rest of the case is empty. There's all the room in the world. I could add another 10 centimeters to this PCB if I wanted to. So, <clears throat> yes, I just <clears throat> grabbed the dimension, dragged it up and, hey, there's room. <laughs> so now um, I even dragged it up more than necessary. Ju well, for two reasons. One is because I like symmetry and look at this. We've got an eight millimeter overhang at the front. We've got an eight millimeter overhang at the back. Hooray for symmetry. Uh, but also it's just <laughs> extra PCB is a place to put a big fat label and it all fits. Uh, so uh, yeah, so often I find myself um, in a corner trying to uh, solve a, a specific problem. Like how do I make this thing fit into this space? It's like, does it need to fit into that space? Make the space bigger. Anyway. <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> UM even? Um, Brian, you said you're on your way to UM. What is, what's UM? And um, you are mod. <laughs> UM even. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> Brian is pretty much in the opposite time zone from me, I believe. <laughs> uh, so it is now heading towards lunchtime on Sunday for me. <clears throat> Brian, what is it for you? It'll be something terrible. Anyway, so upshot of all of that. Now, if I was just doing this for the... Now, I need to explain something about how this was done. In, and I'm going to demonstrate without saving. <laughs> now, what I did was also in the odds that in the, <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> Peter, oh, I made the mistake of mentioning lunch. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Peter is the lunch police. Um, Brian, 2.45 a.m. Saturday night, Sunday morning. Yeah, okay, so you're not quite in the exact opposite time zone, but that is not a very good time to be up and awakened typing chats into a YouTube live stream. Um, <clears throat> but I'm glad you're here. So, uh, okay. What I wanted was for, <clears throat> for the three versions of this <clears throat> to really just be like, the 24 port version has been chopped and so if I now go back and it, what it actually leads to is in the 24 port version there are some things that are a little bit weird and let's have a look at the um, uh, say say T place layer single user mode or single layer mode all right now one thing that you will notice is that all of the useful information other than this URL. So it's got the URL there that by the way, does not work just like most URLs on my PCBs because I designed the PCB and don't ever actually make the page. So apart from that URL, all of the useful stuff is in this first third. It's in that area. It's got the name of the board. It's got the I squared C addresses. 
the reset pull up uh, jumper, which is still a solder jumper, but that's because that is an obscure thing that I think people aren't really going to care about. Um, I just wanted to include it anyway. The I squared C pull ups are on, the, on this one third of the board. The logo is here, the version is here. If we um, flip the board, this is where it, it looks a little bit weird. Look at this, all the labels on the back of the board are in that third. Uh, the copyright notice, the pinout information, it's all there. And that is because the way I generated the 16 port and the 8 port versions is I just duplicated this project, deleted a bunch of stuff and shortened it up. So, um, in fact, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to go the whole hog, but I'm going to do it right now without, uh, without saving to show you what happened. And the way I laid this out, so if I have a look, all right, so you can see here, this is the complete 24 port version. Now, if we go into the schematic, what we've got is first sheet, I squared C, headers and pull ups, reset, interrupt output, we've got power. We've got now the three, in fact, let's, um, let's pull this up in offline mode. I do not want to be in offline mode. I think because of the time zone difference, yeah, Fusion 360 is actually offline right now because they are doing their maintenance in a time that is good for them, but it's not good for me. Now, I was looking for... So if I don't have it cached, I may not even be able to open this. It looks like they've gone into maintenance mode while this live stream is on. Let's see if it opens. Hmm... It does. Okay, so this is the 24 port version. And you can see also that I now have these big decoupling caps, one behind each of the banks of, um, of sockets. You can also see, ta -da, look at all this, resistor networks. So this board had 200 discrete resistors on it, uh, which was getting a little excessive and it was also taking up a fair bit of space. So I ended up switching to um, 1206 size, so K16 resistor networks. And uh, I now have, I've also got, where is it? I have reels, reels. Uh, where did they go? I'm gonna, uh, did they go up here? I can't remember. I had some things arrive. It might be in the back of the garage. Um, no. <laughs> I had some deliveries arrive while there was no power. <laughs> DHL pulled up at my door while we were in darkness. Uh, somewhere here I have reels of... No. Oh, here we go. It's in the LCSC box, of course. <clears throat> so, that is a real each of uh, 10K and 1K resistor networks. So I've got 5,000 of each of those. <clears throat> So when these arrive, we will be able to um, to assemble them. And uh, I also ordered more of the MCPs. So I've got, I think I've got a hundred of those at the moment, which is enough to assemble a few of these boards. And I have a reel of the, in fact, I've got two reels of these capacitors. What I'm <laughs> probably gonna run out of <clears throat> before anything else are these bizarro RJ45 sockets. I do have a few of those, but um, not a lot. I've probably only got about 20 or so. So enough to assemble a few boards, but not enough to last forever. All right, now this. Uh, back to here, back to Eagle. All right, that's right. That's what got me into the 3D view is these decoupling caps that you can see here. And then in the second sheet, I've got the RJ45 sockets. And then all of the sheets after that are the MCPs with their um, associated breakouts. 
and I deliberately structured the, um, the schematic sheets like this so that I could do this. I'm going to go zoink, I'm going to kill, and they're in order. These, um, I'm going to do that, and let's get rid of that, and delete group, and come down here. This is the last sheet. I'll remove that sheet, yes I'm sure, and then remove the, that sheet, yes I'm sure. Okay, that's it. That's all the changes in the schematic. If we now come back to the board, look at this. We've got a board which is missing its last third. Uh, it's still got a few dangling nets and things there, but basically then it's just, um, it's only a you know, minute or two of messing around and deleting a few things, just cleaning up some of this. And do, 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 do. Um, anyway, you get the point. And then normally I would do a little bit more cleaning up, like delete these. Um, yeah, in fact, let's do it. No, not that one. Oh yes, that one will do. Delete these wires, delete that, delete that. I'm not going to bother deleting the silk screen components because this is um, just to show you what I mean. Oh, and then the spacing. Oh, I've got uh, dimension layer turned off. Uh, no, measures. Measures, where is my measures layer? Down here somewhere. Where is it? Where's measures? Why can't I see it? There it is. Measures, turn on measures. All right, so then I do that and then I delete that and I'll delete, which one? That one. All right, now we set the grid to 70 millimeters because we want to move everything in a single 70 millimeter chunk. Go, chunk. oh, and also normally I would delete uh, one pair of holes there Select that, go group, move group. And because we're on a 70 mil grid now, if I just go one chunk to the left, boom, we're done, almost. Oh, that's locked, yeah. Anyway, you get the idea. So a little bit of fiddling around like this and um, with, uh, Unlock that, delete it. Where's my delete? Delete, delete. And set the grid back to one millimeter to something sensible. Um, rat's nest, remove the rat's nest. And then you can see that it's, at this point, all I'd have to do is hook up, like put a wire in there, hook that together, you know, route that, 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 close those air wires, and it's done. So, you know, in that few minutes, I've just generated the 16 port version. Oh, and of course you go in here and do things like, this is now the 16 port version. I've now generated the 16 port version of the project from the 24 port version, and then all I did was duplicate it and do the same thing again, generate the A-port version. So the idea is that, you know, I definitely do not want to be saving this. Save, no. <laughs> I don't want to screw up my um, live version of it. So if I go back to here now, I should have my original unhacked version. So yeah, so as you can see, what I did was I put all of my effort into doing the 24 port version and reworking it over and over again to make it as good as possible. And then from that, I regenerate the 16 and the eight port versions. So those ones aren't, aren't done from scratch. They are always derived from this. So, um, but it means that, because what I was trying to avoid was a situation where I have to maintain three independent board designs in parallel. And um, so, oh yeah, so Cable Tie says, clever, 70 millimeters gr grid. 
yeah, this is the, um, oh, good night, Brian. <laughs> yes, you need to go to bed. Um, uh, you, yeah, this comes back to, this was part of the, that one of the silly grid tricks that I was showing on a previous live stream. One of the things that I really like doing is manipulating the grid to my own advantage. Like, um, oh, and there is actually another really good example right here. Uh, so what we've got, and I did the same trick here. Uh, or did I? What is going on with the grid there? No, I didn't do this trick here. I should have. <laughs> All right. This is another stupid grid trick. Now, let's delete that and that. Imagine you've got a connector. We don't have to imagine. We have one right here. This is a 0.1 inch pitch pin header. And we are on a metric grid. So we've got a label here, which is, so our pin header is at a position of 50 millimeters vertically. So in the Y axis. And our label is at 50 millimeters because it is perfectly aligned. Oh, and um, in this particular case, the label has its anchor on the center left, not the bottom left. So that the center of the label is always going to be perfectly aligned with that uh, row of the pin header. And now you want to put labels up here. So in that case, what I would do is go into grid, set it to and then set the grid to exactly what the spacing is between those headers. So go, I could go into inch, make it 0.1. I could have just, what I actually often do is just make it 2.54 millimeters. It's the same thing. And then I just go copy, drink, chonk, drink, chonk, and then edit and make that a zero and make that one a two and set my grid back to millimeters, one millimeter. And now this is gonna be on some weirdo. It's on 52.2, uh, 52.54 millimeters is the grid position, but it is perfectly aligned with that row. And I haven't had to do any mental calculations or anything. It's just there and spot on. So yeah, one of my, um, my favorite grid tricks in Eagle is just manipulating the units and the spacing to move things relative to each other. And you can put things exactly where you want them without even having to think about it. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. And as you saw before, if I'm doing a major move, like if I wanted to take this whole, um, this whole part of the board and move it 70 millimeters to the left, set your grid to 70 millimeters and then it will move in a nice single chunk step. Um, yeah, hang on. I'm going to have Peter yelling at me for, <laughs> see on, can you please make those sound effects again? What sound effects? <laughs> I, I wasn't even aware that I was doing any. All right, so <clears throat> uh, yeah, we now have this. And yeah, as I was showing before, as you can see, all of the silk screen from the bottom, I think this actually looks kind of weird because I'm used to seeing things left to the left, like left justified and left aligned. So with all of the labels on the right hand side like this, that's just strange. Um, but you can also see that because I ripped this board up many, many times, I rerouted these resistor networks so many times, just tweaking and tweaking and tuning. Uh, look how pretty it is. Uh, and the other thing is that each of these thirds is exactly the same. So if you look at the tracks that are on here and the, um, the position of the, you know, the alignment of all of those buyers and the tracks, and then you step across to the next one, it's the same. They're all the same. 
anyway, <laughs> that's just my obsessiveness sitting there focusing on them, trying to get them all on the exact same position. Uh, there are still some uglinesses in the routing, I know. Please don't look in places like this. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm ashamed of that. And look at this. This is disgusting. Look at this track right here. That's terrible. I don't know why, but it just <laughs> it rubs me up the wrong way. I didn't see that before it went off for production, or I'm sure I would have done something about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Peter is... Peter, do you have an alarm set that goes off at like 11.50 or something and it says, tell John to go and get lunch? <laughs> um, oh, <laughs> yes, it is lunchtime. You are right. <sighs> oh, Sion, um, just put in the link to the GoFundMe again. <laughs> Thanks, Sion. And um, thank you very much. Auto router. I have not used the auto router. <laughs> this is because, yeah, it'll have been from moving things around. And then I didn't catch the fact that it was ugly. Um, so, Sion, thanks for putting that link back in. And I, um, yeah, as I was explaining at the start of the live stream, the goal has been met. I am going to get a new computer. As soon as Apple release one with an M1X or an M2, then I'm going to have a new computer. But if, uh, if anyone does feel like contributing additionally and you have the means and it doesn't stretch you, please don't if it's in any way, you know, a stretch or whatever. I don't want anyone to, um, to, uh, to contribute to their own detriment or if there is something better that you could be doing with the funds. I, I really deeply appreciate it, but um, I, the last thing I want to see is anyone contributing money when they could be using it for their own, um, their own purposes. But uh, any contributions that are made, I will make sure that they are used for the purpose of um, of things related to the live streams or videos. So video production equipment or equipment that I'm going to show. Now, the last thing I'm going to show, I'm just pulling up another browser window off screen here. Uh, the last thing I'm going to show is that I do have, come on, where is it? Oh, and the other thing, uh, while this is loading, I've got to apologize that um, I couldn't ship orders over the last couple of days. So Freetronics and Superhouse orders will be going out on Monday. Now, assuming the post office is open <laughs> on Monday, hopefully it will be. Hopefully Rick will be back in action with power. Um, preview, this is what I'm looking for. So I've got the, um, the point of this is, this is the part of the draft of the page. I've got some content written and uh, as you can see, insert video here. So once I, um, I finish recording the last couple of minutes and, uh, and doing the final edits on this over the air Tasmoda conversion video, I will upload it to YouTube and um, it'll go here in the page and yeah, this page will have all of the um, two-year convert instructions to go with it. And hopefully that will be live for patrons and GitHub sponsors today. Sometime today, that's my goal. It's, uh, it's, it's really close. The longest time, <laughs> the most thing now is just going to be uploading the video uh, and um, finishing off writing the, the content on this page. And then, it'll, yeah, and then I'll make it public. Probably tomorrow, maybe tonight, we'll see. And then I'll try to be more on time for number 44, which will follow next week, which will be um, converting to your devices 
to Tasmoda using direct serial connections. And then the one after that is converting to your devices by replacing the module using something like an ESP, like a D1 Mini if there's room, or a, um, an ESP12 uh, module, which is a direct drop-in replacement for, well, not quite, there are some tweaks. Anyway, I'm preempting the video. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the this is the stuff I've been obsessed with over the last well a long time now. So once I get onto that subject, I just start talking about it. But I'm not going to. Yes. All right. I'm going to go. <laughs> Thanks for hanging around with me on a Sunday morning. And uh, uh, yes. Oh. Um, Aaron said, plus one to creating a dedicated LSC, so light switch controller channel on Discord. Yeah, at the moment, discussion in relation to that has just been in the lighting channel. And I think that's been okay for now. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, I just saw Peter's comment and <laughs> distracted me. Um, I think that's been okay because it is tied into lighting. The LSC project is kind of slightly broader than lighting because it's other people are now using it for things like security sensors and it's, yeah, it's more than just a light switch controller now, even though my version of it still has the light switch controller name. So yeah, maybe we'll need a dedicated channel for it. We will see. But hopefully in, if DHL do their pickup in the next day or two, Although they may not, if um, if JLC PCB are on leave already, DHL may not be able to pick up, which would suck. Then I wouldn't get the boards until after the next live stream, probably, which is a long time. But if things go smoothly, I'll have the boards this week, and I can actually show this what I've got on screen to you for real next week on the live stream. I hope that is the case. So. Have a great weekend, <laughs> and uh, I will be back really soon with a real video, and uh, I will talk to you all next week. So I've got this feeling that there was something that I wanted to mention, but it's too late. <laughs> Peter's already down at the local takeaway shop, so it's too late. <laughs> Oh, Stephen said, I got an LCSE shipping notification at 3 a.m. today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People work around the clock. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, I, appreciate, I appreciate you coming along, and I'm just glad I got my power and internet back in time to do the live stream this week. It was pretty much time perfectly to come back last night and let me prepare. So, uh, why is it that... At the end of these live streams, I can never end them. It always feels like that. No, you hang up. I've just got to say goodbye and hit end. <laughs> Bye.